I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to bring it up because I was hiding it so much that if someone knew or if my fiance knew, he was going to leave me. And so it was really, and I like to share pictures of my wedding date because I was, I, I started taking Adderall to get things done and I was drinking around the clock and I had no idea how I was going to do it. How I was going to get everything done with the extent of expectations that I set. And um, I started, I mean, the entire day I was kind of buzzed and then I blacked out. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy, a Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges. One thing is for sure, You'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison. Greetings, compadres. You know that I love nothing more than to talk to other sober sisters. And so today I have Jen Hurst on, and I'm so excited to get to know her. I was reading through her stuff, and I was like, ah! I was fangirling, getting super excited to meet her. So she's here. She has been alcohol-free since April 24th, 2013. And here's what's cool, Jen, is that you and I have kind of similar uh, sober anniversary dates. So I am April 23rd, 2011. No way. Yeah. So we're not that far (sighs) apart. And I love that. That's just fun. So I can even remember like that moment of of just leading up to my wedding that around that time so I can even when you got sober to then two years later when I ultimately got sober it's just yeah pivotal how much your life can change yes it is in amazing and unexpected ways right like okay so Jen helps women boost their confidence and sobriety by implementing excuse me, implementing healthy habits from the start. So her programs highlight the importance of taking care of yourself, all aspects of sobriety, nutrition, sleep, movement, breath work, et cetera. All so vital, by the way, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to quit drinking, right? I mean, you can, but you're not going to get the full benefits. Um, Her group coaching programs have helped hundreds of women from across the world own their sobriety with a supportive community of women cheering them on. Props. Love it. She currently resides in Minnesota with her husband and two children. So welcome, Jen. I'm so pumped to have you here. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's, It's so cool to hear your bio read by someone else. And you're so right is, is, what I do now is when you get sober, it's not just about not drinking or just meetings. And that's what I felt in my journey into sobriety. And I love that we have really close sober dates too, because we have that experience of kind of going from, especially when this whole sober movement didn't really exist 10, 12 years ago right. of going through the process that we did to where we are now, where I kept thinking it's, it's so much more than that. And just because you, you stopped drinking, now you got to address all of these things. And it's really about taking care of yourself. And it's like this kind of puzzle piece is what I like to refer to it as if you had a visual that all of these things kind of play a role in keeping you sober. They play a role in basically how you feel from how much, again, how much sleep are you getting? What are you putting into your body? Are you moving your body? All plays a role in your mood and and your basis of, of how you feel on a day-to-day basis. And that's really what sobriety is, is taking care of yourself and to do that on a daily basis. So yeah, it's so much more than that. And it's it's on this continual journey to just find ways to feel the best that we ever can. And I think that's what we want in life is to feel good most of the time Mm -hmm. and to find ways to do that. So 
Yeah. Well, you're so right. And, and on that note, you know, that's what I was chasing when I was drinking was I was chasing, how do I feel better? How do I get out of this misery? Right. And I kept drinking, thinking that eventually I was going to reach some kind of peak Zen or happiness. And for some reason, I was completely surprised that I never reached that point and kind of couldn't get there, which to me sounds silly today, right? But um, at the time, I was just desperate. I was desperate to feel better. And I just thought, well, I guess I just need more. I need more, 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 more of what mm-hmm. doesn't work. But what I didn't know was that it didn't work, you know, yeah. it seemed like a solution at the time. Mm-hmm. But that being said, um, I would love to just give you the floor and have you dive in and tell us about your recovery journey. Yeah, absolutely. And I always like to say, and maybe it was with you too, is that it can really happen to anyone and that looks can be really deceiving. I know on my page, I share a lot of before and after pictures and you wouldn't think (laughs) that I had a problem. I was just, I was really good at hiding it until it just became apparent where I just gave up and I, I could not hide this anymore. But for years I suffered in silence because I think I was so, I had so much pride of, and I was raised, especially as a child, raised in a perfectionist family, loving parents. They rarely drank. My grandfather was an alcoholic. So my mother rarely drank. Um, We did have alcohol in the home and my dad and mom, they would have maybe a beer, maybe two. And so I've never, ever seen them drunk. So I didn't come from that kind of upbringing, but I was based and brought up to place value in what other people thought of you and status was everything. And I kind of was brought up into this perfectionist family where I could achieve love by what I could produce. And I quickly learned that of if I get straight A's, I get rewarded and I get love. And if I can get this award, then my parents are really happy. So I should try to do this. And so I just kept trying to achieve the impossible and I never could. And I would just beat myself up. And I didn't know that I was doing this, but I just know my goal here is to achieve. But if someone knew what I was doing to self-medicate, what were they going to think? Oh my gosh, the label prevented me from getting sober for so long of that. If people knew that about me, what were they going to think? They were going to think I'm broken as someone who could achieve and do all of this, who appeared like she had it all together. Inside, she was sneaking alcohol. She was drinking around the clock. She was suffering from crippling anxiety, but it didn't start that way. And what I like to say is, when there's kind of there's kind of like a spectrum when you consider drinking there's gray area drinkers there's occasional drinkers then you have the more moderate to the habitual then to the very very severe and i would like to say is number one you don't need to have a problem to question your relationship with alcohol i think that's becoming more mainstream nowadays is that it's turning more of okay, I need to stop drinking because I have a problem to now I want to stop drinking because I want to feel good. Mm -hmm. And I love that reframe. And I'm so happy we're getting to be there of really having people starting to question in before it gets to that point that probably you and I took it Mm -hmm. to where we, I needed it to even survive. And, but Mine was more of the very severe cases, but you wouldn't know it because number one, we did social media wasn't like it was today. I'm sure if my drinking was within the past five years, I would have had pictures all over the place. But for me, I did my drinking in secret Mm -hmm. and no one really knew. And when you would see me out, yes, I would have some embarrassing moments, but they didn't see me when I got home. They didn't see the pregame. They didn't see all of the things that I did because I was so crippling. I was shy. I was an introvert. And going to those things scared the crap out of me. And so I had just, quote unquote, normal drinking. I had my first drink at 15, raided my parents' liquor cabinet with friends. 
maybe we have similar stories if you're listening to this. And then, of course, I didn't, I mean, I got drunk, I it was got, got hung over, all of those, but especially through high school and college, it was quote unquote normal drinking where it was, I wasn't really using it to run from anything. It was, okay, go to this kegger here, we go here. And it wasn't until, and I like to say this, and I think this is the benefit that you can do. And if you haven't done this yet, is to do what's co- called a usage history or writing out your sober story. So just like I'm voicing it here, to actually write it out. And this can be really hard to, and it can be hard to also remember all of the things that happened in your drinking career. But it was through this process in one of my treatments that I was able to pinpoint the exact moment where it turned from having fun to now I'm going to start medicating. And it was, I think I was junior year of college, senior year of college, and I was living with some guys and they were doing Adderall. And I said, okay, I'm I'm not going to do Adderall. Like that's a drug. <laughs> Laughable now because alcohol is a drug. I'm like, huh, didn't even know that. I, mean, I, I don't do drugs. I've tried marijuana. I hated it. And, but I'm like, when my second boyfriend wanted to go on a break, I was so in this fight or flight. I didn't know what to do. I thought my life was over. And they said, you know what? If you take this, you're going to feel like God. And I'm like, you're going to feel, you're not even going to think about him. You're going to feel amazing. And I'm like, oh, and I, I contemplated it. I'm like, you know, what the hell? I'm just going to do it. And I took three. And if you don't know what Adderall is, it's for ADHD. It's a stimulant or it makes you a hyper or it made me hyper and it makes you just like euphoria. And I took it and I felt amazing. I said, this is the best thing that we've ever, that I've ever done. And I stayed up all night. I dyed my hair. And then of course the crash came and the anxiety rose and all of those pain, all of the pain, all of that stuff was still there, but it was just magnified. But then it got me, not that I was addicted to Adderall, but it got me to think if I could do that and I could take that away, I could do the same with alcohol. Alcohol changes me. I could just start drinking. Anytime that life got hard or I didn't want to feel, and I I thought that I could earn love through men and that I didn't have to feel any sort of pain over losing that person. Mm -hmm. And so I just started to drink. And it wasn't like the next day I was full blown. I think there was many many red flags, especially in the summer of 2005, where I had some really big embarrassing moments. But it wasn't until, and I just started to use it anytime I felt anxious, anytime I felt uncomfortable, I would start to drink. Anytime before a date, I would start to drink. I'm like, oh, this is just like my my like comfort right here. I can just do this anytime I feel scared. And little did I know it was actually causing so much anxiety like alcohol does when it goes through withdrawal, where I then got put on medication for my anxiety. And it was in the year leading up to my wedding where as a classic workaholic and overachiever, I started, I love to work. (laughs) And I was working full time, I'm a graphic designer, And I was doing freelance full time to earn some extra money for our wedding too. And then I was planning my wedding all by myself. And I, but I didn't ask for help. I didn't want anybody's help because I wanted it my way and I wanted it to be perfect. And so I was working around the clock and I would just start drinking. And in this period, I started dating my, of course, now husband. He did not know. And there was periods where sometimes I wouldn't even need it. And, but there was also these moments where I would overdo it. And there was even periods where I really cut back on my drinking in, in this period, but then I would kind of transfer addict or cross addict into over-exercising. I was looking for that dopamine hit and I would get that by running, by working out, by trying to be perfect, trying to be that size two, which I achieved as someone who really struggled with body image, I thought if I get to a size two, then I'm going to be happy and then everything is going to be great. And when I got there, and this is just a testament, that will never make you happy. It really does have to come from the inside. 
I was still unhappy or still just not feeling like I wanted to feel. So I would kind of cross addict into there, but it was that in that year. And I was just, I would drink to unwind. I would drink to relax. And I would do that every evening and I would stay home and I'd work and my fiance would go out. I'm like, no, I would, I'm just going to get some things done. And I just kept doing it and doing it. And I needed more and more. And it was in this period, I started giving myself goals. Okay. If you can go three days, you're not an alcoholic. And I would start to do the Google searches. Am I an alcoholic? And then I would check all of them except one. I'm like, oh my God, thank God. And then I started researching Alcoholics Anonymous because that's all I knew. You know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I had no idea what to do. If like you have a problem, you go to AA and you're you're broken. But that wasn't me. And and I could I still had my job and I still had all this other stuff, but I was still struggling. So where did I fit in? I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to bring it up because I was hiding it so much that if someone knew or if my fiance knew, he was going to leave me. And so it was really, and I like to share pictures of my wedding date because I was, I, I started taking Adderall to get things done and I was drinking around the clock and I had no idea how I was going to do it. How I was going to get everything done with the extent expectations that I set and um i started i mean the entire day i was kind of buzzed and then i blacked out and i didn't give myself any sort of break my work wouldn't allow it after i got married and a day or two later i just completely collapsed and i started drinking around the clock like not even hiding it and my husband found out and began the year and a half process of me on this discovery of figuring out what was going on losing things really quickly because it just kept getting worse and worse to experimenting with other forms of alcohol because I felt so much shame and people were watching me and I would start to rotate liquor stores and entering into my first outpatient, going to my first AA meeting with my husband still drunk, crying. I remember throwing up before I went in, um, feeling so scared. And I didn't know what to do. And I just felt like I was trapped and nothing was working. And I eventually went to my first inpatient stay. I thought I kept preventing myself from going there because I always thought I was going to lose my job. My, my biggest thing was my job. And if like, what were going to people going to say, if I just left for 30 days, they're definitely going to find out until I just had to. And, um, turns out FMLA protects us. Thank you so much. But I just had this overwhelming fear of what other people were going to think. What are, how am I going to answer? Where were you? And, um, and so I've been to three inpatient stays, one extended care stay for over 60 days at Hazelden. And it was in this period, I got my second DWI, February 13th of 2013. My second one, my first one was uh, January 1st of 2005, classic New Year's Eve. And then the second one was February 13th. And it was in this period where I really wanted sobriety, but I just wasn't ready. And I'm someone that just had to push it a little bit further and a little bit further because I'm very tenacious. And I, when I set my mind to do something, I'm going to freaking do it. And when I couldn't do this, I didn't know why. Why can I not do this? What's wrong with me? And, and I just wasn't ready. I still had to push it. I had to get to the point where my husband had kicked me out. I was living with my parents. Uh, I didn't have a car because it got impounded from my second DWI. I lost my job in February because of not showing up to work. Uh, and I had no money. I started, I didn't know what was going to happen. And it, it took me. And at this point, I'd never really had a problem with Adderall, but I also knew it helped to alleviate any hangover symptoms that I felt. So I could appear like I was sober. And so I would still take that, but I also knew that was preventing me from ultimately getting sober because no one knew I was doing it. And so in order for me to ultimately get sober, I had to come clean some husband. But before that, 
I remember I was staying with my parents and I was on my childhood bed and I, and my shakes, I was having severe withdrawal syndrome or symptoms. I was shaking. I remember trying to get my license a month after because a name change, you have to get a new license, you have to get a new passport, you have to change your name, all of these things. And I was struggling so bad with hang with, um, hangover symptoms and shaking that I actually had to, I tried to fill out the form at the DMV and I couldn't fill it out because my hands were shaking so much. So I had to bring it home. I had to drink, fill it out when I was drunk so I could write and then go in the next day, probably still drunk and take my license picture. And so in that period, I was sitting on my childhood bed and I was my hands were starting to get numb and my heart was palpitating. And I didn't know after months and a year of experimenting with mouthwash, with rubbing alcohol and taking Adderall and drinking because my, when I did the Adderall, when it came off, my anxiety was high. So I drink all of the pressure that was doing to my heart. And I'm like, I don't, I feel like I'm going to go into cardiac arrest. And my parents didn't know I was still appearing like I was sober and I would raid their cabinet looking for vanilla extract, anything that I could get my hands on to crave, to fix that craving. And I started searching up cardiac arrest and it said, drink some milk. And I'm like, okay, if I tell them this, they're going to freak out. They're going to take me to the hospital. So I did that. And it was in these period, I had to go with my dad to work because I had to take they had to keep tabs on me. And then I was able to kind of sneak away into Target downtown. I was able to buy some mouthwash and chug that. And I blacked out at his office. And that's when he took me and they took me into the hospital. And I came to, and um, and sorry, I'm spending so much time on not the great parts. Anyways, I came to, and I basically started crying and told my mom, I asked her, help me. And they took me to detox. And it was in T-Docs where I blew a 0.34. And not that that number, it's high, it's not super high, but the fact that I've been doing that for the past two years, I didn't know what other days, I drank way more than that, that I was so close to not waking up. And that really scared me. And I had court the next day for my DWI and it was in there. And I remember I was sitting on the bed full of anxiety. Oh my God, what did I do? Where's my life going to go from here? I have no money. I'm going to have to do this. I have court. My husband's not talking to me. My parents are done with me. And it was in that moment I had like an out of body experience where I'm just like, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? What the hell am I doing? I'm literally going to die. And if I don't do this, I'm not, I'm not, I have no life. And at that point I was ready. And it was in that, that detox where I just said, I'm done. I'm so freaking done. And I didn't know what was going to happen, but all I knew was that if I don't drink, as long as I don't drink, I can't make this any worse. And I just kept doing that. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's so much easier when you stop trying to fight it and you just learn to surrender and to accept it. And from that moment forward, I had to actually call homeless shelters because I didn't know where I was going to go. So my parents didn't want me there. Uh, ultimately, they let me come back and I went into my last inpatient stay. And I didn't expect anyone to believe me. I didn't say I'm sorry to anybody. I just started following and doing the actions. I started walking the talk. I went to treatment. I got uh, my probation officer. I did my day in jail. I went to court. I paid my fees. I got a job at a local printing shop that I could bike to. And it's amazing what can happen when you just keep doing the next right thing Mm -hmm. and you stop trying to fight this. Uh, within three months, I got a job back in my field. Within four months, we learned we were pregnant, something I always wanted, but I couldn't do because I couldn't take care of myself. And in six months, I was promoted. And thing, not saying life was perfect, but God, if this could happen <laughs> this amount of time, holy smokes. 
And my son was the greatest gift to come. He was supposed to come after my sober anniversary, but surprise, he came six weeks early. He was the greatest gift to come from making this decision was that like, my body could actually produce life mm. was absolutely incredible to me and a healthy boy. Like he's, he's awesome. He's huge. He's just, he's so tall. And, um, and so I just kept doing that, those things and, and life became so much easier and I didn't want to do it anymore. I just had enough. And eventually I started to earn the trust back from my family and from my husband. And we began to build this beautiful life. And before I went into my last inpatient stay, I knew I had to come clean about my Adderall use to him. It was preventing me from staying sober because he had to know everything. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, and it took, it was, I was so nervous. And I thought he was going to like run and like tear everything out and be like, I can't, and which is not my husband, but in my mind, my mind had the, exactly what was going to go on. And I sat him down and I said everything. And he's like, okay. He's like, are you done? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, then we're good. As long as you're okay, then we're okay. I'm like, oh, I'm like that, that went way different in my head because I didn't say this because I thought you were going to do this. This is why your thoughts are so tricky and they're so powerful to just start looking at those thoughts and what's actually true. But honesty was such, such a powerful tool and so key in me making this stick. And I just kept doing the next right thing. And I did, I did AA for the next four years, four to five years. And I, I appreciate AA and that's what they taught me in inpatient. But there was also some part of me that didn't really agree with not sharing this with other people. It made me feel like there was something still wrong with me that, and I kept saying, why why do we have to be so quiet about it? And I understand why. I understand the traditions, but I didn't want to. <laughs> and I'm like, why is it that if I don't go to a meeting, I'm going to relapse, but I'm also doing these really good things like moving my body and doing all this other stuff that is super helpful for me. And so I thought maybe I could do this a different way. And I didn't know I could or that that's possible. And it wasn't until, and I can keep going if you want, um, how I got into I'm sober like coaching. I'm like mesmerized. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I didn't share. And so in these four years, and I kind of have two really big pivotal dates. So April 24th of 2013 is my sobriety date. And I have it tattooed on my wrist. But the other big pivotal point was September 7th of 2017, because that's when I came out of the sober closet. And for four years, again, I still was so scared of what other people thought if they knew that about me. It was something that I didn't share. It was something that I kept hidden. And, and unless I had to reveal it, like when I went on house arrest and had to do a day in jail, I had to tell my boss, which was very humbling. And my God, and I know you've done jail too, but man, what a humbling experience <laughs> when I was four months pregnant. Um, doing that, but you just take responsibility and you start to just clean up one thing at a time. Okay. Lawyer. All right. Breathalyzer. Got it. Okay. Doing this thing, doing that thing. But it was in this moment where I started to become a beach body coach, which is now body mm -hmm. something I, I wasn't set out to do. I didn't want to do, but it was, I started following this woman, random woman on the internet, never do this. She put us, put up this transformation, which I thought was incredible. I'm like, my God, look at her body. She was so muscular. And I thought that was so incredible as a woman to put on that much muscle. So I started following her. It turns out she was a coach and she went to this summit. I'm like, there's a reason I'm following her. And maybe I should start to do this because I love working out. And I love these programs because they help me lose the baby weight from home. And I love to move my body. And it also taught me how to eat in a way that nourishes my body that's sustainable. So I became a coach and part of that process is sharing your story. And as something and that I didn't really say to anybody, but I wanted to talk about, I just didn't think people cared. No one asked me about it, but I think people were so nervous to talk to me about it. Or maybe again, they didn't care, but I, I was so open to sharing it. 
So I said to my husband within two weeks of starting to post, which was really awkward. I never had pictures of myself. I always wore black. I always hid behind the camera. I was like, I think I'm going to come out and I'm not going to hide anybody. And every single year on my soberversary, I would do a post, but I would hide people from my job. <laughs> Be like, well, I don't want them to know. And I don't want them to know. And I certainly don't want them to know. But this one was like, no one's hidden. And I just came out and I was like, hey, I'm Jen. I'm an alcoholic. And I, I wrote it in like two minutes and it was so easy to write. And it just laid it out. And I remember I posted it right before I went into a meeting and I threw the phone. I'm like, oh my God, I can't even fucking, I can't even believe I did that. Holy crap. And I came back and it was like nothing but love and encouragement. And I'm like, oh, and I remember that feeling. I was like, now I don't have to hide. Mm -hmm. And now everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be, and maybe there'll be some more questions as to why I'm doing, but now I'm, freaking and I would swear but I don't know if you can swear but I'm freaking owning it and the, and I didn't it wasn't like pure confidence like I have today it was just these little breadcrumbs and I thought ideally okay I'm gonna leave my job and become a full-time beach body coach but in this process of sharing my story just a little bit of breadcrumbs like okay I'm just gonna share a little bit more and then I started to realize people don't, I don't think I'm supposed to help women lose weight I think I'm supposed to help them get sober Mm -hmm. I think they're interested in how I did it. And it, it was in like 2018, 2019, where I started this idea, like, what if I started coaching people? But then I said, oh, I'm not qualified. And I'm not, but I'm like, the only qualification is experience. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time that you've had. And my gosh, I've had seven years. I think it was seven, what is it, six or seven years. And there's something working mm -hmm. that I'm doing. Something, something's working. And people are interested and they're asking how I did it. So what if I could put a program together that's not AA based, but of how I would do it on how to live sober. That once you do this and taking them step by step through the process. Okay, before you even stop, let's go through what you you're, might experience. Let's go through withdrawals. That I think it's so, so important to know. And I mean, alcohol is the one of the drugs that you can die from withdrawal. Mm -hmm. You could experience this. You could also not experience it. But just knowing that, okay, can alleviate any anxiety that you have going into it so you can be better prepared. Week one, this is what we're going to do. Week two, let's, how do you set a boundary? What are you going to say to people? How mm -hmm. do you calm the F down? in times of stress, when life throws you a curveball, just like it did last week, what tools am I going to use? Who am I going to reach out to? And what if I could do this in a community of women who are all doing the same thing so we could rally around each other and cheer each other on? Because that is the power, is you need connection, you need accountability, and you need to know that you're not alone. And so that's what I created and that turned into also a membership. But essentially what I like to do is just take women through doing this process in a way that just has them feel so good in times where it can feel really lonely and isolating. Mm -hmm. And so not that I'm saying it's going to be a guarantee because that all depends on you and everyone's journey is unique and different and amazing and messy. But my God, it's worth it. And if I can get you first, take, for instance, your journey is from here and it goes all the way like this to over here. If I could just shorten that amount of time for you so you don't have to and experience the DUIs, even though that might be part of your journey, if I could just help you and shorten that period to get you to where you want to be a little bit quicker, mm -hmm. then that's a huge freaking win. So... Yeah, that's kind of my story from where it started to where I am today. And it's just continues to evolve. And never in a million years did I think this was what was going to be my career ever as something that I was so nervous to talk about to now is the one thing I love to talk about. And by talking about it and helping other women, it helps me stay sober mm -hmm. in the process. So, yeah. Oh, Jen. Okay. So you blew me away 
thank you for sharing all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of what you said, relatable. Um, And I love so much that you've been able to, you know, take all of your experience and pass that on to women in a practical way. Because I think, you know, you even, and I have like wrote a thousand notes, but even just now, one of the last things you said when you were sharing was, you know, I wanted to give women an opportunity to practice like, what? okay, so, you know, what are you going to say when people ask why you're not drinking, for example, or whatever? And I think that those are the nuts and bolts. And um, I myself am a 12 step uh, community person. I'm still actively involved in 12 step communities, but I in no way think that that is the only way to get sober at all. I am so thrilled in this day and age. We have so many options for so many different kinds of people and what works for them because it's really a custom process and it's really not a one size fits all thing. But there's this little yellow book um, called Living Sober and, and it's cheesy because it's really old now. So if you look through it, some of the suggestions are really like, what? Like, what kind of language is this? You know, because it's really old. But the idea of like, so can I never host a party again? What, you know, I mean, that is the kind of content that's in that little yellow book. But to make it present day for right now, for women in 2024, who may be mothers, who may have, you know, big careers, who may be in all kinds of different practices in life and juggling so many plates. That's huge to practice these tools. And and I love that you're doing that because I think sometimes, you know, we get involved in some of these um, lofty online um, sobriety things and they're wonderful. I'm not saying they're not, but I think when the rubber meets the road, we have to have those practical like, okay, so what am I going to do in five minutes when this feeling may come over? What are a couple things that maybe I could try? And I feel like a lot of times that's what's lacking and missing is those real practical tools. So mad props to you for teaching that in your coaching business. I love that. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And, yeah. And, and so, I mean, without, I have like a bunch of questions to ask you about getting sober, which I'll try and just kind of ask them thematically. But, um, I, you know, I love that you shared just so honestly about, I mean, the anxiety piece, huge, right? That was huge. Yeah. I remember also thinking like, well, first of all, I'm going crazy. Second of all, I have anxiety. Like that's my problem. I'm drinking because I have anxiety, not realizing, no, no, no. The alcohol is contributing to that anxiety yes. causing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm drinking because I have anxiety and I have anxiety because I keep drinking. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like this crazy wheel, like stuck on this treadmill of doom. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I loved that. And, and yeah, I mean, the whole jail thing, I'm with you, sister. Like that for me was my rock bottom. And I wanted to ask you, uh, because I've had this theme that keeps popping up in my life currently today, present time about fear of failure. And I remember when I was in jail and I was like admitting to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic and I was truly owning that. The big thing for me was like, what if I fail? And then no one's going to believe that I really am trying here. And so it's going to become, you know, and I was projecting all this stuff, right? Like, then I'm just going to constantly be this like, oh, her. Yeah, well, she keeps saying she wants to get sober, but she doesn't. So yeah. uh, how do you help women process through that fear of failure, which I don't have with alcohol anymore, but I do have like in other areas of my life now. And I just, um, 
you know, I've been researching a lot about it. So I'd love to hear how you coach women through that in their early days of sobriety. Mm -hmm. Of, of if it doesn't work out. Well, failure, fearing. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry. That was a yeah. super long winded way of asking, yeah. you know, what if I fail? Mm -hmm. And that's such a good, and especially when women are considering joining my programs, they're like, well, what is, what makes this time different? And I'm like, ah, oh, it's honestly, that all comes down to you. Mm -hmm. And I always like to, there's this quote that says, oh, well, I think it's in, usually in like centers or act, kids activity centers, what it says, well, what if I fail? And it responds with, well, what if you fly? Mm -hmm. What if this was it? And I like to reframe that because it all instills in this belief within yourself. Mm -hmm. What if it all, and Mel Robbins, who I love, she always mm -hmm. says, what if it all works out? Yeah. What if it turns out better than you ever imagined? Because as Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Mm -hmm. Whatever you believe is going to be true. Mm -hmm. And if you have a slip up, and this is what I encourage in my groups, is that if that happens, Congratulations, mm -hmm. because I like to reframe failure as incredible learning opportunities. As I, God, I, I, I went back a thousand times, but every single one of those, I learned something and it got me mentally closer to making that decision, mm -hmm. that black or white decision where I was, I was just done. Mm -hmm. So reframing that and not to say and the worst thing that could happen and actually what's the worst that can happen okay so you go back but the worst thing that could happen is that you pull away and you isolate mm -hmm. i want this to be a non-judgment zone but i also want you to take that and to learn from it so i have some questions that i ask them of okay what was going on but then also it what it does is it highlights a trigger for you Something mm -hmm. happened, whether it was before that, maybe it's your job, your husband, um, emotions, uh, something happened that triggered you. Maybe it's a time of day, a location, something that that is incredible information that now you can use for next time to adjust. Okay. Mm -hmm. Usually what that means is we probably need to set a boundary. Mm -hmm. Triggers need to set boundaries. And that's why I really love to experience that, but if they can go through that in the group, then we can work with it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a failure, it's right. a learning opportunity. And if we're just scared to even try anything, we're, it, we're just gonna stay stuck the whole time. I was I've, I'm still working through making and embarrassing myself in sports. If I'm not good, I was taught, if I'm not good, I'm not gonna try it if i'm not the best mm -hmm. and so I, it prevented me from even trying things mm -hmm. but knowing that you know what i'm not gonna die mm -hmm. and the only way to get better is to keep failing is to keep getting back up and to keep practicing and to keep going and so um the mindset piece how you start this really and i like to start with the end in mind mm -hmm. how do you want to feel Mm -hmm. experience yourself on day in one year from now alcohol free mm -hmm. and what does that look like and if you can go through past failures you didn't die mm -hmm. like every single th one of those failures are probably incredible things that you learned from that mm -hmm. and that's why and that can shape you into who you are mm -hmm. and so number one you're not going to die but also what can you learn from it Mm -hmm. And that your mindset towards this is going to direct you of what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's where I like to, to really focus on number one, the mindset, but also reframing that mm -hmm. and not making it so like all or nothing. Like if I fail, it's over. No, you just pick yourself up and you keep going. Mm -hmm. Like that's the process. Unfortunately, it sucks if it happens. That doesn't mean you need to quit. You need to keep going mm -hmm. because again, identify the trigger, which then leads probably to a boundary. You adjust and now you're shaping your sober life based on that. And so I, I just like to look for the good in those things. I love it so much. That was so beautifully said because 
you know, the best tool I have learned in my past almost 13 years of sobriety, the most powerful tool is reframing, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's the biggest thing. And if I can get there, it's like, that's half the battle, right? Like that is half of me moving forward in something. And, you know, even, even when you were talking about going to the DMV and like, Mm. I can't fill out the form because I'm shaking so badly, you know, I love that even then in your disease or time of unsobriety or whatever you refer to in that time period, whatever you call it, you were able to recognize, well, I got to get this done. So I got to figure out how to do it and then come back the next day. Right. Yeah. But, but literally that's life. Like that is how we do this thing. And I love that, you know, you've created a space for people to come together and do it together and share those experiences and tools. And, you know, I love that you talked about looking at your experiences in life and then just kind of going, okay, so what did I learn from that? Because that right there, I think is such a powerful thing. It's like, you know, whatever happened was more information for the next choice, right? And so to be able to start to look at that and troubleshoot it, and then sometimes it's like, well, man, you know, I did the opposite of what I did the last time and it still turned out topsy-turvy, but it's like, well, okay, so what's next, you know? Mm -hmm. And having that sense of curiosity, just, I really sense that in, in you, that you, um, that you instill in women. And I love that so, so much. I love what you're doing and um, the work that you are involved in. It's just so valuable. So thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And I think too, um, the teacher in you struck me like the whole idea of being the fitness coach and then letting that door open and unfold into sober coaching and recovery coaching. And, you know, when we get sober, we get to follow where those doors lead. And I know when I was drinking, I didn't have any doors, you know, I was doors were closing, right? (laughs) All right. There's your car, right? There's your, there's your job. Uh, there's your money. I'm like, yeah, yeah, where's, where's that? And I think Laura McGowan says like the third or where's like the third door where, where where everything works and I can make this where it just, it just doesn't work. And you can try it, but I always like to say, it's like fitting a square peg in a round hole. It, it just doesn't work. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us or there's anything wrong with you. It's just, your body is just doing. And I think that's also what's really helpful is understanding the process Mm. god through books through sober literature podcasts like this one to just start understanding oh my god i didn't never knew that alcohol was a drug until 2018 when i read this naked mind i'm like what Mm -hmm. i was taking drugs this whole i was like and i realized this at a garth brooks concert Mm. and i was reading that or listening to this naked mind and i started to just look and observe. And then I saw all the vendors selling drugs, selling alcohol. I then started to see people consume it and get sloppy. Mm. And then I'm like, oh my God, we're selling drugs. We're Mm. consuming it. And then we're making bad decisions, thinking that we could drive home because our prefrontal cortex is offline. We're not making the best decisions. And then we get punished for it because we're not in control anymore. And then that even leads us down to feeling bad about ourselves. So then we keep drinking and then we're in this just, I'm like, oh my God. It was just like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I woke up. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of what reading can do. And mm-hmm. doing your own research because they're not going to tell you. No. And that's up to you. And just it just so happens in recent, in the past year or two, where more and more information is, beca- is coming out. But it's still not a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's up to you to figure that out of what they don't want you to know. Mm-hmm. And once you know, you cannot unknow. It mm-hmm. is like, oh, 
And I was like, oh my, and now I, I notice it in movies. I notice it in kids' movies of what my kids are watching. I saw my son watch a woman on the baseball. We were in Minnesota, so we went to a Twins game. And it was at night. So on the Jumbotron, they showed her, she had a beer. You know, it's like webcam, scanning the crowd. She had a beer, she started chugging it. Everyone started to cheer. And when she was done, the whole stadium went wild. And I watched my son watch her. Mm. And he's like, mommy, what is she doing? And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, and it's just to just become aware of mm -hmm. these different touch points mm -hmm. is fascinating. So as a parent, now I can understand and see what my kids are seeing and starting to have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Because it we think it doesn't make a difference, mm -hmm. but it really freaking does in yep. your subconscious. And so um I won't get into that, but it's just, it's just becoming aware. Mm -hmm. It's, and the things, the songs that I listen to, watching Friends episodes back, mm -hmm. which is my favorite show, I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh my, I was seventh grade watching that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't think it was a big deal, but now to see it from the other side, once you're out of the matrix, mm -hmm. you're like, wow, if that was heroin or cocaine, Mm -hmm. And everyone was just doing it for fun. Like we'd have a completely, di we have a completely different mindset, but what makes alcohol different? Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's still a drug. Anyway, mm -hmm. I don't have to get into that. I could go <laughs> forever about that. No, but that's so maybe. good though. Cause it, it is, it's just so true. And you actually set that up for the perfect wrap up. Cause I wanted to make sure before we ended that I talked about parenting. Mm. And, um, so you set that up perfectly with the story about the Minnesota. You're Trump welcome. Game. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, which is, you know, how do you find you have a relationship talking about recovery with your kids? What is kind of your perspective on that? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because my son is nine, he's going to be 10. But he, they started learning about drugs last year. And I remember him coming home with a skunk and it said, drugs stink. I'm like, oh, are you learning about this? And so he's becoming more curious. And I've started to wear this on my shirt. So it said sober mom. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, what is, or sober is cool or something. And he's like, well, what does sober mean? And this was last year or two years ago. And then I questioned, I'm like, is he ready to talk about this? But if they're witnessing people drinking alcohol. They're ready to talk about the other way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very honest, but I'm also not saying a ton. But sob sobriety or sober means someone that doesn't drink alcohol. And I don't drink. And I haven't drank in 10 years. And he's like, oh, okay. Or when he said alcohol. Oh, so he said, well, what's that? Um, and I said, well, things like beer. And he, Or maybe he said, oh, so I see dad drink that. He has beer. And so little have we ever mentioned it have we ever but they're watching they pick up on this stuff and there's been touch points where he'll see an ad and then we'll ta start to talk about it so he has he right now he hates it he knows it knows it's not good for him i don't i'm trying to take an open approach i'm not going to try to sway him one way but i'm making sure he can make an informed decision that he knows both sides because i never did I only mm -hmm. knew one side. My parents didn't drink, but we never talked about it. Mm -hmm. And so as long as I can keep him talking and mm -hmm. the reasons why I didn't, and when he asks if I don't, I can be honest that about my story, the older that he gets and the more questions that he asks. But just to acknowledge that, to see it for what it is and to be that example mm -hmm. for them I don't think there's anything better that we can do as a parent because they're going to take in, they learn from example mm -hmm. and from what I'm doing to waking up at 445 to move my body, read, do all of those things to take care of myself, to say, I'm sorry, I, I have to go on a walk. Mm -hmm. I need to get through this or I need to scream right now mm -hmm. or allowing them to feel feelings. Mm -hmm. And in that, it, like, that's just this, Oh, it's so incredibly helpful when you go to work on yourself, that's going to be reflected in your kids that, yeah. He, okay, yeah, cry, scream it out. I'm never going to tell you to not cry. Mm. I'm never going to say that. I'm going to allow you to experience things so you don't have to figure out how to breathe when you're 40 years old, which I'm now teaching my clients. Mm. 
is that you can learn to move through these emotions. And if you guys want a great movie to check out any age with your kids, with not, you got to watch the movie Inside Out. Oh, it yeah. is all based on emotions. And you guys, the Inside Out 2 is coming this summer. And the new emotion, the big new emotion is anxiety. Mm. And it is one of the best movies. I think every kid should watch it. Every adult should watch it. And you realize every emotion is valid and every emotion needs to be felt. No emotion is bad, that, but you must allow yourself to experience those things if you want to move through life. Right. That you will not die from feeling something. You'll actually freaking grow. So yeah. it's so helpful as a parent. Well, and it's like that phrase, you know, you got to feel it to heal it. Mm -hmm. And I think at least um, in my generation, when we were growing up, the big deal was just stuff it. Yeah. So whatever you're feeling, just stuff it, you know? And then some of us who weren't so good at that, right? Eventually we're like, oh, wait a minute. If I drink, oh, this goes away. Where has this been all my life, you know? So I love that we're so friendly to you know, experiencing emotions and that that's normal. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, like I didn't know it was okay to be up one day and down the next. And I didn't know that that was normal. You know, I thought every day I was just supposed to be happy all the time. <laughs> yeah. And even as a woman, I mean, I'm 41. Now I'm learning about perimenopause. What's that? Yeah. I didn't even know that your hormones fluctuate on a 28 day cycle that I'm just learning about this stuff. Yeah. I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, this would have been helpful in my I, years. But yeah. now I know so I can help my daughter and also, again, learn for myself about perimenopause. Exactly. Okay. So Jen Hurst, I have, I would love to have you back on sometime. I would absolutely love to further unpack some of this because you are inspiring. You're doing incredible stuff. And, you know, I want to just say as we close that one of the most beautiful things that I personally have seen about having an April soberversary birthday, and which you have too, is that it represents, you know, it's springtime, it's new life, it's a rebirth. And I love that because I see it in you. It's just totally evident in your whole aura and persona and in everything that you are coming alongside and helping and guiding women to do and find their own voice and their own new life. And so I want to thank you for coming on and I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. And yeah. And um, where can people find more about you? Where can people follow you? Yeah, uh, I love to hang out on Instagram. So it's Jen Lee Hurst, J E N L E E H I R S T, if I can spell my name right. And then my website is joinlighthousesobriety.com. And my whole company is based about being that lighthouse of we don't need to shout sobriety from the rooftops, but we can learn to stand tall and confident in this choice and light the way of sobriety for others. So I encourage you to be that lighthouse if you're listening and to embrace this decision because it's one of the best decisions you'll ever make. Well, Jen, you are that lighthouse. Thank you so much. So are you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So if you're listening, remember to be kind, rewind, Thank you for the honor of your time. Take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy, a mom of eight's journey from jail to joy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. You can keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.